Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Tan. And I'm Emily Stu. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Police commissioner announces arrest of nine people over chopping attack on former Ming Pao editor Kevin Lau. HKTV boss Ricky Wong and government in war of words over obstacle to his mobile television plans. Beijing accepts Siwa Leung's proposal to take all 70 lawmakers on mainland visit. Mainland police have arrested two Hong Kong triad members accused of attacking former Ming Pao chief editor Kevin Lau with a chopper last month. Hong Kong police have arrested another seven men here in connection with the brutal attack, which they say does not appear to be linked to Lau's newspaper work. But Lau's family has rejected that theory and is urging the police to find the mastermind. Police Commissioner Andy Zhang had a big announcement late this afternoon. He revealed that Dongguan authorities, based on evidence provided by Hong Kong, had on Sunday arrested two men suspected of the brutal chopping attack on former Ming Pao chief editor Kevin Lau. The pair, both aged 37 years, were identified as Hong Kong residents and triad members. Another seven men were arrested in Hong Kong in connection with the attack. In this investigation, we will leave no stone unturned. Uh, the investigation is still ongoing. Uh, at the moment, we suspect that uh, the assailants uh, were hired and that they had tried background. Uh, and, and of the seven other persons whom we have arrested, we suspect that they have varying, varying degree of participation. As for the motive... We will not rule out any possibility at the moment, but according to information we have in hand, there's nothing to indicate that this is directly related to journalistic work. And of course, our investigation is ongoing. Hong Kong police are now liaising with their mainland counterparts to bring the suspects back here. Uh, as you probably realize, we have no rendition agreement with mainland China. And so we have to rely on our existing cooperative framework, which is based on negotiation. Now we will follow up with the mainland authority and, uh, and, and, uh, and explain to them that uh, we need them back. Zhang did not rule out making further arrests. Chief Executive Leung Chinying came out to praise the police for their quick work. But Lau's wife Vivian Chan disagreed with the police assessment of the motive, insisting the attack was linked to her husband's journalistic work. She's urging the police to find the real motive and track down the mastermind. Chan said her family is clean and not involved in any dispute, whether personal or over money. Getting hold of the mastermind may be impossible. After veteran Democratic Party lawmaker Albert Ho was attacked by three men in a McDonald's restaurant in August 2006, police managed to track down the culprits and bring them to court. But the judge who jailed them rejected their stated motives and lamented the fact that the mastermind was still at large, while Ho himself believes his attackers were paid well to keep quiet. Lau was rushed to Eastern Hospital after he was attacked in broad daylight on Taiwan Street in Saiwan Ho last month. He had just parked his car in the morning when he was attacked with a meat cleaver by two men on a motorcycle. Lau may take two years to recover from his injuries. He had just been replaced as chief editor of Ming Pao and moved to the newspaper's electronic books and teaching materials division. The transfer angered Ming Pao journalists, who saw it as a crackdown on press freedom. It prompted thousands of journalists and their supporters to march on the streets to demand justice and complain about the threat to press freedom. HKTV boss Ricky Wong and the government are caught up in a war of words over rules blocking his plans to launch a mobile television service. Wong claims the government is changing the rules to stop him while the communications authorities is insisting it's only following the law. Embattled HKTV boss Ricky Wong took on the communications authority today in a war of words. In two separate radio shows, he accused the government of moving the goalposts and implementing the broadcasting ordinance selectively to discriminate against operators like him. The media tycoon said officials had made it very clear that mobile television licenses would not be regulated under that ordinance when it was last amended in 2010. He asked why the government suddenly decided to regulate his mobile TV license. 
But the broadcast watchdog said he was warned two months ago that his planned launch might violate the regulations. Authority Chairman Ambrose Ho said Wong's planned mobile TV service will be received by more than 5,000 domestic households, whereas the channel is only supposed to reach moving devices. And under the license, um, he is entitled to have uh, operator service for reception at moving locations in Hong Kong. Say, for example, if you have uh, a, a, a mobile device, uh, like your handset telephone set, uh, or alternatively uh, um, an iPad or, or, or one of these uh, um, computers. Since HKTV's mobile channel is likely to reach more than 5,000 households, it has to be monitored by the broadcasting ordinance and will therefore require a free-to-air or pay TV license, he explained. HKTV was denied a free-to-air license last October, prompting Wong to announce plans to launch his mobile television channel instead. Ho stressed there's nothing wrong with Wong's original proposal when he spent $142 million to buy the mobile TV license of China Mobile Hong Kong because he used a format called CMMB to transmit content. But when Wong told the watchdog that he wants to upgrade to the DTMB standard, that became a problem. The more advanced module will enable HKTV's mobile TV programs to reach over 5,000 homes. The DTMB standard is now um, the same standard used by ATV and TVB in providing their digital uh, television service. And therefore, it exceeds, it goes beyond uh, what is the mobile television license that Mr. Wong is, 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 is currently holding. The explanation did not convince Wong, who said later this afternoon that regardless of the format, HKTV's mobile signal will not reach most Hong Kong homes. He pointed out that over 90% of the city's buildings are equipped with rooftop filters to screen out signals other than those from ATV or TVB. The HKTV boss said as long as the Office of the Communications Authority, or OCA, makes sure the remaining buildings install their filters, there would be no problem. The only solution is, is not whether we choose which standard. The only solution is OFCA, uh, as an enforcement agency, fulfill their duty to educate the public and to ensure that all the management office install the filter. Wong claimed he never meant to bypass the broadcasting ordinance to access domestic households via his mobile television channel, adding that he's also open to using other formats to transmit content. The HKTV boss vowed to take the government to court over the attempt to halt his mobile television channel, saying he's sure to win. He has already launched a legal challenge against the government's decision to deny him a free-to-air license. The High Court will hear his bid for a judicial review in August. LegCo President Sung Yuk Singh has waded into the controversy and called on the government to explain its actions. He said Wong's allegations are serious and the administration must show that it's not imposing new requirements on particular individuals or institutions discriminately. The central government is inviting all Hong Kong lawmakers, including blacklisted Pan Democrats, to Shanghai next month. Chief Executive Lan Chen Ying, who proposed the visit, said mainland authorities will handle visa issues. It's being billed as a major breakthrough at a time when lawmakers are divided over government policy and Beijing's plans for universal suffrage. All 70 Hong Kong legislators from across the political spectrum have been given the green light to visit the mainland. Chief Executive Lan Chenying said late this afternoon that Beijing agreed to his proposal to invite the lawmakers to Shanghai on the 12th and 13th of next month. Uh, members of the Legislative Council uh, will uh, visit uh, uh, Shanghai and they also join a uh, seminar. Uh, I shall join them. Uh, at uh, part or some of the activities. The problem is some legislators from the pan-democratic camp have been blacklisted by Beijing and do not have home return permits which they need to cross the border. But Leung said the relevant departments on the mainland will deal with visas and permits. He did not rule out a meeting between officials from Beijing and the Hong Kong lawmakers to discuss issues of mutual interest. Leung added that the visit will enable lawmakers to better understand the mainland's economic development and efforts to improve communication between the two sides. The tour comes at a time when the government is seeking views on political reform. But there's a large gap between the pro-Beijing camp and the pan-Democrats, who are pressing for civic or political party nomination for the next chief executive election in 2017. 
Cathay Pacific says cost-cutting measures and a rise in mainland passengers have helped net profits surge threefold to $2.6 billion. Revenue last year was $100, was $100 billion as passenger numbers rose by 3% to $30 million, with strong demand from the mainland. The strong revenue base enabled Hong Kong's flag carrier to rec record a sharp rise in net profit compared with $862 million in 2012 when high fuel costs affected earnings. To combat the problem and offset volatility in oil prices, the airline upgraded its fleet and introduced a fuel hedging program which extends into 2016. There's more confusion surrounding the disappearance of the Malaysia Airlines plane that vanished on Saturday after an Air Force official denied saying it changed course. That had prompted international rescue teams to expand their searches in areas it's unlikely the plane flew over. ATV's Banner Work reports. Ships and aircraft from several countries are still scouring the seas around Vietnam and Malaysia for the passenger jet that went missing shortly after leaving Kuala Lumpur for Beijing on Saturday morning. The search team say it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But when you're looking for something in this wide sea, uh, it's a reality check how to find even a huge aircraft like a 777. But we must never, never give up hope. But hope is running out for the relatives of the 239 people, most of them Chinese nationals, on board Malaysia Airlines flight MH370. At Kuala Lumpur's airport, travellers have been leaving messages and prayers for the passengers and crew. It's quite a mystery because the plane suddenly disappeared like that, without any trace. At the moment, I just can say that, just wait and see, because we don't want to spread any news, uh, false news. But that's exactly what's happened. Malaysia's Air Force Chief Rodzali Dowd today denied media reports that the military had tracked the plane for an hour after it disappeared from radar and that it changed direction towards the Strait of Malacca. That prompted a search of an area that wasn't on the plane's original flight plan. The new revelation has added to confusion over the disappearance and angered the Vietnamese government which sent rescuers to the new area. But Vietnam denied reports that it will scale down the searches. Malaysian officials came out today to say they were now focusing the hunt on two main areas. The lack of news is taking its toll on families of the missing passengers, like the Burroughs in Brisbane, Australia, whose son Rod and his wife were on the plane. They've declined an offer by Malaysia Airlines to fly them to Kuala Lumpur to wait for news. We don't know what we're going to do or anything because it's not much use going there when they haven't got a clue where the plane's gone. But a group of relatives of mainland passengers have accepted the offer, only it must be on their terms. After a closed-door meeting, the airline agreed to five demands made by the families over their flights and accommodation. It will fly five relatives of each passenger to Malaysia if there are enough seats, with relatives considered fragile travelling business class. They'll get free meals and an allowance of 31,000 yuan that will be separate from the final compensation. Plus, they'll be briefed three times a day on the progress of the investigation. Ben O'Rourke, ATV News. China's top political advisory body has closed its annual session with Chairman Yu Zhengsheng reaffirming Beijing's commitment to upholding Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy. But two key phrases were left out of the CPPCC's official resolution, raising eyebrows again about what Beijing has in mind. ATV's Britain Clanet reports. The 10-day session of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference ended today with Chairman Yu Zhengsheng delivering his work report to 3,000 delegates in Beijing's Great Hall of the People. The audience included President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang. Yu underlined Beijing's unwavering commitment to upholding Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and respecting the one country, two systems principle. A political resolution passed by CPPCC members also acknowledged the one country, two systems concept, but it left out two key phrases enshrined in the basic law, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, and a high degree of autonomy for the SAR. Just a week ago, Premier Lee Keqiang also left out the two clauses when he delivered his maiden work report at the opening of the National People's Congress session. That omission triggered fears in Hong Kong that China is planning to tighten its grip on the city. But Chief 
executive Lan Chenying played it down, saying people should not engage in pointless speculation just because senior leaders did not repeat important phrases. Mainland and local officials joined Lan in urging Hong Kong residents and the media not to be overly sensitive. In his address today, Yu also said Hong Kong and Macau CPPCC delegates should play a greater role on the mainland and at home. Yu also took the opportunity to condemn the deadly Kunming terrorist attack on the 1st of March. Xinjiang separatists were accused of going on a knife rampage at a railway station, killing 29 people and wounding more than 140 in the southwestern city. The chairman said the top political advisory body fully supports the government's efforts to crack down on terrorism in accordance with the law. Yu called for improvements in the ethnic regional autonomous system to strengthen national unity and improve people's livelihood. He said the CPPCC has a role to play in promoting social harmony and protecting national security and ethnic unity. Britain Clinet, ATV News. Turkey's embattled prime minister is facing a fresh outbreak of unrest across his country. This time the flashpoint is the death of a boy, nine months after he was injured in a crackdown on anti-government protesters. Here's Ben Arouk. Protesters took to the streets in cities across Turkey overnight. A flashback to last summer's long-running rallies against government plans to turn a park in Istanbul into a shopping centre and flats. This time, the mobs were angry about the death of a 15-year-old boy who'd been in a coma since he was hit on the head by a tear gas canister during last year's unrest. Only 14 at the time, Baikin Elwan was caught up in the street battles while going to the shops to buy some bread for his family. Opposition politicians held regular vigils at the boy's hospital. He was the sixth person to die due to last year's violence, the worst unrest under Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan. Police used tear gas again to try to control last night's protesters. The protesters fought back with rocks and fireworks. The unrest is another headache for Erdogan, who is already facing a widespread backlash for threatening last week to ban Facebook and YouTube. That's after a series of audio recordings posted on the internet, apparently exposing corruption within his government. In a recent recording, Erdogan is said to be heard on the phone yelling to a newspaper owner and suggesting he fire the writers of an article he didn't like. He insists the crackdown on internet freedom is needed to stop a smear campaign in the run-up to a national election. He's also asking for greater government control over judges and prosecutors. President Abdullah Gul says the internet ban is not going to happen. Ben O'Rourke, KTV News. A family in the U.S. had to call the police after they were trapped in the bedroom by the large and aggressive cat. They say the cat attacked their baby first, then held them hostage. Here's Britain Clenet. Meet Lux, the Himalayan cat that apparently held a family in Portland hostage in their bedroom. The drama was captured in a 911 call that owner Lee Palmer made to complain that the feisty animal, weighing nearly 10 kilos, had attacked his baby boy and was terrorizing them. Yeah, hi. I have a kind of a particular emergency here. Um, my cat attacked our uh, seven-month-old child. And I kicked the button, the cat in the rear, and it has went off over the edge, and we um, aren't safe around the cat. It's a very large Himalayan, and we're trapped in our bedroom. He won't let us out of our door. Okay, does the, the child need medical attention? No, no, he's just got scratches on his forehead. But the cat, we don't know what to do about the cat. He's gone, oh, he's trying to attack us. He's very, 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 very hostile. So I tried to get a hold of animal control. Hang on just a second, you guys are inside your bedroom right now. Yeah, yeah, and if I, when I leave out the bedroom to let the police in, I'm going to have to fight this cat. The drama ended with police snaring Lux and putting him in a crate. The family is thinking of ditching their aggressive pet for the sake of the baby. Britain Clenet, ATV News.